Good morning. Yesterday, yesterday we celebrated um, my middle daughter's 22nd birthday. Yeah, Tony. <laughs> um, yes. And so we uh, went out to dinner or went out to lunch, late lunch, about 1.30. And then we went down to the beach in Malibu, which is an odd thing to do when it's only 63 degrees. This time you get yeah. But anyways, primarily to fly a kite, which we did. It was very windy. Kite worked quite well, though. So if you ever tell me to go fly a kite, been there, done that. <laughs> and we also did a little shopping at Costco. Yes, I wanted to buy an olive tree. <laughs> Yesterday, Ruth told me, you're going to talk about this, aren't you? <laughs> Oh wow, didn't get the olive tree. Oh, it was it was it has one. I just said that, those that drag them all the way back. It's only this tall. Could have fed. Could have put it in your leaf. Actually, we put it in the hand, so there's plenty of space. You wouldn't need it too, though. No, yeah, one is fine. Look, you want to get all of those. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. And we have two almond trees, so. <laughs> Trying to collect biblical trees, we've got almond tree, pomegranate tree, we need an olive tree. Do you have a fig tree? No, we had a fig oh. tree, it didn't survive, I've got to try again, I don't want to It was cursed. Yeah. Yes. I gave my father an avocado one time, and the tree was dead, and he said, Wow. Yeah. But there was no other avocado tree. Almond trees are really wild. Uh, probably the best of any of the trees we've got. The apple tree that has not given us any apples yet. Of course, it's only this tall, but yeah. So, hey, the fig tree gave us figs as soon as we planted and then it died. Anyway, uh, the author of Hebrews um, wants to make a point. And his point is that Jesus is superior to everyone and everything. And that the cross changes your world. Now, the BBC a few years ago had a spin-off of Doctor Who called Torchwood. I doubt that many of you have even heard of mm -hmm. Isaac. Yeah. You didn't? Why not a spin-off? Yeah, a spin-off from Doctor Who. That's why Doctor Who okay. sometimes showed up in it. Oh. <laughs> and Jack Harkness, one of the characters, was also in Doctor Who. Anyway. Um, the tagline at the beginning of the series was the 21st century is when everything changes, you've got to be ready. And that's kind of what the author of Hebrews is saying. First century, in the first century everything changes, you've got to be ready. Um, and it's a good description of what Jesus did, that is he changed everything. And the world has never been the same since Jesus. Uh, another science fiction reference, uh, perhaps even more obscure, although the author of this book is the guy that did the Trouble of Tribbles in Star Trek. If you've ever watched Star Trek, you know about Tribbles. David Gerald is the author of that particular episode, and he wrote a book several years ago called The Man Who Folded Himself. David Gerald is not a Christian. It's quite clear to reading that book because he has time to go back and kill Jesus. But he's unhappy with how the world turns out after that. And so he goes back and talks himself out of doing it. So you have even a non-Christian who's not at all sympathetic to Christianity recognizing that the world has changed in a good way as a consequence of Jesus having been here. Uh, but is he a Christian really No, he's not a Christian. No, David Gerald is not a Christian. Uh, he's probably agnostic at best, be my guess. I don't really know what his religious beliefs are, but... <laughs> um, but anyway, the world has changed because of Christianity, because of Jesus coming. That is, whether you're in Afghanistan or Riyadh or Jerusalem, it's the year 2018, which is dating from the birth of Jesus. So that very basic how we measure time goes back nowadays to Jesus. Um, Things like human rights, uh, women's rights, uh, the concept of war crimes. These things would not be if it hadn't been for Christianity. 
Christianity is responsible for those concepts and those concerns. But Jesus is more significant than just the cultural changes that have manifested from his existence. The author of Hebrews is concerned with how Jesus has upended everything that has uh, been the basis of Jewish existence up to that point. That is, if you look at the book of Hebrews, it starts out by telling us that Jesus is better than angels. He tells us that Jesus is better than Moses. He tells us that Jesus is better than the prophets. And now he's moved on to Jesus is better than the priests. And as a consequence of all this, everything is going to change now. That is, the basis of Jewish life, the Old Covenant, the Old Contract, the Old Testament, is going to go away, and that's the point of what the passages we're going to look at today. That you're going to need a new contract now. Things have changed so radically. Because of Jesus, the entire mosaic system has been overturned. The kosher regulations to the sacrificial system, from the priests to the temple worship. Jesus fulfilled it all. He finished it all. He changed everything. The first century is when everything changes, and they and we have got to be ready. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 8, which talks about the full nature and significance of the change. The change that besides changing civilization, more importantly, changes the lives of individuals. Individual hearts, individual minds, individual lives. So Hebrews chapter 8, it's only 13 verses, so we can manage to get through it all today, perhaps. Now, um, yeah. Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve the sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry of Jesus has received as a superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one since the new covenant is established on better premises or promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, and I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after the, that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness, and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Let's pray. Father, help us to fully comprehend the significance of the new covenant that you've established with us. Help us to understand how that changes everything. Bless our time together in Jesus' name. Now he starts out by saying this is the main point. So this is kind of what he's been leading up to, to this moment in his uh, letter. What the author of Hebrews has been going on about in chapter 7 was that Melchizedek is like Jesus, a better priest than those of the Levites. And now the author of Hebrews is going to make his or her point nailing what, has, what this has all been about, which is that Jesus is better. Same thing he's been arguing since the very beginning. Jesus is the high priest. He serves beside his Father in heaven, sitting at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. 
serves as a true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Now, in verse 5, the author points out that what has been going on to this point has been a shadow of uh, the reality of what's in heaven. It's not the ultimate thing. It's not the final reality. It served as a picture, a shadow of ultimate reality. Now, how many of you are familiar with the allegory of the cave? Okay. You need better education. <laughs> I like to gather No one else was looking, was reading the allegory of the cave in sixth grade? Apparently not. Okay. Well, that's why you're here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. The allegory of the cave is something that Plato wrote. It's, based, it's a dialogue between Socrates and Plato's brother. And the picture is that Socrates describes a group of people who have lived chained to a wall in a cave all their lives. And the opening of the cave is behind them, and the sunlight shines and casts shadows on the wall of the cave. And the people, all they know about reality are the shadows they see on the walls. And they give names to the shadows and imagine what the world is based on the shadows that they see. In the story, Plato says a philosopher goes, is able to escape, find out what reality is, and he comes back and tries to explain it to the people. And of course, they can't understand, don't really believe him. Well, this story, this allegory, of course, had been around for 500 years by the time the author of Hebrews writes it. And you get this imagery occasionally in the Bible, the, you know, the shaft, that you know, we're only seeing shadows, we're seeing through glass darkly. Whether or not the authors are referencing this story or not, I don't know, but it would be a fairly popular story at the time that this was being written. Uh, and you'll see that Paul argues in a comparable way in his letter to the Colossian church. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 70, he says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. And so the ultimate reality is something other than the shadows that we see. And so the practices of Judaism, the keeping the kosher laws, the festivals, the uh, sacrifices, these are all a shadow of the things that were to come. That is, the reality is found in Jesus. Jesus is the real thing. Uh, Paul goes on to point out uh, that the focus on rules and regulations are shadows. It's part of the worldliness that he points out in verses 20 through 21 of the same chapter, Colossians chapter 2. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom, but their self-imposed worship, their false humility, their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual desires. Rules and regulations are not going to keep you from doing bad things. You know that because you ignore the traffic signs. So rules don't help. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. Therefore, the ministry of Jesus is superior to that of the priest, since the covenant of which he is the mediator is superior to the old one. There is a new contract, a new covenant, and it's the name that's given to the last part of the Bible, the New Testament. That's why we refer to the New Testament and the Old Testament. It's because of what the author of Hebrews is talking about in this chapter. So verse 7, For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming and so on. The author of Hebrews quotes from a prophecy of Jeremiah, 
in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. That's the wording of the new covenant that we have here. And the author of Hebrews quotes from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the passage, but it's virtually identical to the Hebrew section, so there's nothing to talk about there. Aside to reassure you that it's exactly the same. Now, what is the context of this passage in Jeremiah chapter 31 that uh, the author of Hebrews is quoting from? The context is that Nebuchadnezzar has conquered Jerusalem and has appointed Zedekiah as the king. Some people have already been taken away captive and worse is yet to come. Jeremiah sends a letter to those that are in exile already and tells them to settle down, plant vineyards, you know, you're gonna be there for the next 70 years. And so in Jeremiah chapter 30, he begins a series of prophecies. In chapter 30, verse three, he writes, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll bring my people Israel and Judah back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess. In Jeremiah chapter 31, which is the quote that the author of Hebrews quotes, you also have another passage that you may recognize that the Gospel of Matthew quotes. In Jeremiah 31, 15, it says, This is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. That, of course, is a prophecy of what Herod's going to do to babies two years and old. Uh, younger in his attempt to prevent Jesus from surviving. Um, so the prophecy of the new covenant is predicted to be in a time frame after they have returned from the Babylonian captivity. And so the author of Hebrews is very clear. If the Old Testament the old contract had been perfect, if there hadn't been anything wrong with it, then why would there be any reason for a new covenant or a contract or a testament to be made? And of course, the reason they need new ones is because the old one was broken, and broken in more than one way. That is, broken in the sense that they had never bothered to keep it themselves. That is, they had broken pretty much every commandment, every line in the old contract. Uh, but also it was kind of like an old car that was broken and didn't quite work right anyway. Uh, but they had violated the contract over and over and over again. Peter points out in his uh, discussion in Acts chapter 15, when they're trying to decide what to do about the Gentiles, and he makes the comment in Acts 15 verse 10, when he's talking about the problem. He says, now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. That is, Peter and the Jewish people recognized that the old contract wasn't working, that they were not able to keep it, nobody was able to keep it. And so, again, you needed a new contract, something different, something better, something that couldn't be broken. And so, the problem, of course, is that some people, when they look at this, they'll think that, well, does that mean that the church is replacing Israel? That the new covenant means that God is done with the Jewish people and has nothing more to do with them, as God cast them off. And, of course, remember from our study of Romans, that can't possibly be the case because Paul says very explicitly, in Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, I asked them, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they've torn down your altars. I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. And then you have a little passage in Romans chapter 11, verses 25 to 32, that says, um, 
I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And this way all Israel will be saved. As it's written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as, in, as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. Verse 29 is a critical verse. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. That should be greatly comforting to us. That is, if God has called you, if God has made a promise to you, if God has given you something, it's permanent. He's not going to take it away. He can't. He says that it's irrevocable. And so the same thing with God's relationship with the Jewish people. He made this contract with them. It's an irrevocable thing. And that's the point that Paul makes. But if you read the words there in uh, Hebrews chapter 8, who is the new covenant given to? To Judah and to Israel. And so then you wonder, or you might wonder if you're thinking about it, what about us Gentiles, us Roy? How do we fit into this? If this covenant is given to the Israelites, to the people of Judah, then how is it that we appropriate it at all? How is it that we can be part of the new covenant if it's given to them? Again, Paul takes care of that for us. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 18. <clears throat> Therefore, remember that formerly you who were called Gentiles by birth, and called uncircumcised by those who, who themselves, by those who call themselves the circumcision. I'll get my mouth to work eventually. I have not drunk recently. Which is done in the body by human hands. Remember, at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. We were in bad shape. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier of the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we have access to the Father by one spirit. And of course we'll talk about this concept also in Romans 11. Uh, so we have become naturalized citizens. We have become part of of uh, Israel, it's kind of God's uh, DACA plan. Uh, we've been grafted into the nation of Israel. We have been granted adoption. We have been made part of the people of God through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. The way has been opened to all, not just to the Jewish people, but to the entire human race. All of humanity now becomes a part of Israel. We're all Jewish. The church does not replace Israel. The church is Israel. We Gentiles do not take the place of the Jews. We join them. We become a part of God's chosen race through Jesus. And that is how the new covenant applies to us then, because we're part of the people to whom it has been given. So, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 through 13, you have the words of the new covenant laid out. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. So what exactly is the nature of the new covenant? How does it differ from the old one? The primary difference is in what occurred at Pentecost. That's how the law is written on our hearts, is by what the Holy Spirit does to us. 
In Acts chapter 1, verse 4b, last week Ruth and I had a discussion about the necessity of adding where you're starting from, 4b through 5, <laughs> Jesus tells the disciples the following after the resurrection, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, Peter explains to everybody that's there what in the world has just happened. And he quotes from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, to explain it. He says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. I want to read you a couple passages on what it is that the Holy Spirit does. These are from the Gospel of John. John, Jesus in the Gospel of John talks about the work of the Spirit. John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. If you love me, keep my commands. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, that is the Holy Spirit, to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. The Holy Spirit enters us when we become Christians. The law is written on our hearts, it's written on our minds. It's inescapable. This is why we don't have to tell people to know the Lord if you're a Christian because you've already got God living inside of you. How much more could you get? And then John chapter 15, I'll focus on just part of this, but the whole passage, which is probably up there, uh, John 15, 26 through 16, 15. But I want to look at verses uh, 13 through 15. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will, he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine, that is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So where the old covenant was written on stone tablets that were over a ways away, and you'd have to go and hunt them down and look at them. Well, you didn't have printing presses back then, so you'd have to find wherever somebody copied them down or actually find the copies themselves. But now you've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you. It's not just written out here somewhere, it's right inside, you can't escape it. And so, verse 10 here in Hebrews chapter 8, I will put my laws in their minds, Write them on their hearts, I will be their God, they will be my people. Verse 11, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit. As Peter wrote, and I've quoted this passage before in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, his divine power has given us everything. We need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them we may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. And then verse 12, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This is what uh, God coming into us does for us. 
We have been get, forgiven permanently and forever. We do not need repeated sacrifices year after year. One sacrifice by Jesus took care of all our sins. God has forgiven our wickedness and will remember our sins no more. Now that wording is a little bit odd when you stop and think about it. So let's stop and think about it. <laughs> Jesus' sacrifice occurred 2,000 years ago. The final sacrifice. And from that moment, there in the past, ancient history, it says he will remember their sins no more. Book of Revelation puts it even weirder, which is not surprising, it's the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation 13, 8, you have this little phrase, the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Now, the crucifixion occurred 2,000 years ago, and then here in Revelation it says, slain from the creation of the world. In the movie, I like to do science fiction references, in the movie Star Trek First Contact, there's an interesting scene between Captain John Luc Picard and the Borg Queen. Now, at the beginning of the movie, the Borg ship is destroyed, and you think the Borg Queen, everybody's dead. And then here she shows up later in the movie. And Captain Picard says, um, yes, I remember you. You were there all the time. But that ship and all the Borg on it were destroyed. And the Borg Queen comments, you think in such three-dimensional terms, how small you become. We think in three-dimensional terms, in linear time. God apparently is not quite so limited. He remembers our sins no more. We remember the past. God can remember the future. Or in this case, he doesn't remember the future. Though our sins were and are all in the future, from the crucifixion when they were all paid for, and though the crucifixion from our perspective is 2,000 years in the past, it was an accomplished fact from the perspective of God since the creation of the world. He could remember it even though it was in the future. So don't be thinking in such three-dimensional terms. Our sins are old news to God. They are nailed to the cross in our past. They are ancient history even if they're still in our future. That sin you're going to do tomorrow when you're on the freeway and the guy cuts you off and you make a, and you do something with your hand that you really shouldn't. Um, doesn't matter anymore. God does not even bother to remember them, even the ones that from our perspective we haven't done yet. For God, they are old news, ancient in the past, and paid in full. So, verse 13 says, whatever is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Within less than 10 years of those words being penned, Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the Romans. The entire system of sacrifice, the priests, it all came to an end. And it remains that way today. Even modern day Judaism does not practice the old covenant. There are no priests, there is no temple, there is no sacrifice. The center, the very foundation, the sum of the whole way of living has vanished utterly. To such an extent that even the most orthodox rabbi no more longs for a rebuilt temple or the slaughter of sheep than you or I do. Jesus paid it all. The law, all its associated works, in Jesus it is finished. We are now made righteous by faith alone, by grace alone, by Christ alone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time that we've spent here this morning looking at what the new covenant means and how it applies to us. Help us to remember that you have paid it all and there's nothing left for us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.